Jack Smith, special counsel prosecuting Trump, is a little bit nervous. You can feel the panic in his bones as he submits his petition to the Supreme Court. Why is he going to the Supreme Court right now, you might wonder? Because he's already got an appeal that's on appeal at the lower level court, but he's trying to leapfrog them. He's trying to jump over the Court of Appeals because he is in a hurry. They really want to prosecute Trump. We know that the trial on the January 6th case is already scheduled for March 4th, the day before Super Tuesday on March 5th and they want to keep that trial date because that's going to be when they can convict Trump. And they've got a limited time to do that. They need to be able to come out after that, which might be a six-week trial, and say Trump has been convicted so that they can use that in the election. And if they postpone it, man, if they have to bump this thing, they're not going to want to bump it later in on the year, closer to the election. So they might have to go into 2025. And that means they lose everything they're working for. So they are filing quickly and asking the Supreme Court, please, please, please respond, even though it's not really supposed to be there and we'll see what the Supreme Court says about it. We'll go through the filing, then we'll see how MSNBC is talking about why this is a smart move and why I think this is not a smart move, why I think this is really them being boxed in, trying to get something done before the clock runs out. This is the filing Jack Smith taking it to the Supreme Court of the United States. And this is the Super Bowl, my friends. This is where we want to be. We've been waiting for this. We've been waiting for Trump to get us here, but Jack Smith is taking us here right away. And the issue here is about presidential immunity. And if Trump is successful here, the charges are going to go away. <laughs> like gone, gone. And so depending on how this goes, it could be the end of the case or it could be Trump continues to be prosecuted. But what's curious is Jack is going quickly. Now, as a quick side note, I thought Jack Smith had all these issues settled. I don't know why he's appealing this. I thought that he knew that presidential immunity was not something that Trump could legitimately claim and that this was all settled. This was just an ordinary case. No one's above the law. They kept screaming at us. Remember that? No one's above the law. No one's above the law. Now he's asking the Supreme Court, excuse me, Supreme Court up there, is Trump above the law? I think he might be. Derp, idiots. That's why you should have figured this out or maybe not charged him in the first place. But now we're here and Jack Smith is a little bit nervous. You see the United States of America is the petitioner out of SCOTUS versus Donald Trump on petition for a writ of certiorari before judgment. See that? Before judgment. They're currently in the DC Circuit Court of Appeals on this issue that Trump took it to. And now they're saying, we gotta go faster. All right, if we can't get this done, then Trump might have an opportunity to postpone the trial date. And that's really what we don't want. But as we go through this, let's ask ourselves, what is the urgency here? Okay, what does Jack Smith fear if this is not settled in the ordinary course of business? Okay, many other trials take a long time, especially when they involve what they claim to be is the most sophisticated and you know extensive investigation in Justice Department history, which is like laughable, by the way, because what if they prosecuted about 1,200 people? <laughs> which is a joke. It's like a Super Bowl weekend or something like that, okay? Produces way more crimes than that. So it's basically insane. But these people are now at the Supreme Court and they're going to be asking for clarification on this and it's going to be dispositive. And we've been waiting for this. We can't wait to see what SCOTUS does. But what if SCOTUS doesn't do anything? What if SCOTUS tells Jack Smith, uh, 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 it's not ready yet. Go back through the Court of Appeals and then we'll see you later. That means that everything gets stayed. Trial's probably gonna get postponed. So we've got a lot of different permutations that we can unpack here. Here is the question that Jack Smith is asking of the Supreme Court court, which is wild because I thought this was already figured out because no one's above the law. Here's the question is, and whether a former president, whether he is absolutely immune from federal prosecution for crimes committed while in office or is constitutionally protected from federal prosecution when he has been impeached, but not convicted before the criminal proceedings begin. Man, those are two very nice, very juicy questions that we are very excited to unpack. And we've already un gone through several of these issues. Okay, one is Trump is immune literally just by virtue of the fact that he is the president executing the laws, right? So there's just immunity that you get. For example, when you are a police officer, right? You're executing the laws, you arrest somebody, they get injured, they sue you, they say you shouldn't have arrested me so hard, and then you claim qualified immunity. Hey, I'm immune from that lawsuit because I was doing my job, it wasn't excessive force, blah, 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 you know all the crap they say. So that is the framework, right? The president, by virtue of the fact that he is executing the laws. In this case, Trump is legitimately arguing that the election was rigged and he is the executor of the country at that moment on January 6th. And he's got a duty to make sure that the elections are not rigged. And if he's got the opinion and the take, you may disagree with it, that the election was rigged. He's got an obligation to make that known and to go and say, hey, Mike Pence, there's some problems here. And you know our opinion on the election here and why he was justified to call foul. So that's point number one. But then point number two, which is a separate, you know, it's a related issue. Either one of these, if the answer is 
Yes, gone. Case is gone. Is Trump absolutely immune? SCOTUS comes out, let's say 6-3. Yeah, he is. Boom, case is over. They lose. Now think about that also, by the way. Okay, this would be a very good out. You know, at this pace, it's going to take two months to get through this document, but we'll pick it up the pace here. But think about that. Now, what if Jack Smith and these people know that this case has been botched from the beginning, that it should have never been brought? They were hoping that the prosecutions would cause Americans to rally against Trump and they failed, right? They've actually made him a martyr. And so now they want to say, uh-oh, what we've kind of bitten off more than we can chew here. What if they can pitch this on SCOTUS? They can just blame it back over to SCOTUS. Say, oh, we tried to prosecute an insurrectionist, but SCOTUS came back out and said Trump's immune from prosecution, right? Then they make the Supreme Court the boogeyman, the bad guy. Then they say, see, this is why you got to rally back over to our side and support us in packing the court and Joe Biden needs to win. Otherwise, the Supreme Court in cahoots with Trump are going to seize power of American democracy, whatever. You know the story. So you can see how this can ping pong both ways, right? The court would take it away from them. And this is the reason why I get nervous about the court is because the court doesn't like to do that, right? The court doesn't really like to step on the toes of the executive branch. We saw that when John Roberts led us through the Obamacare debacle. We were all sitting here like, there's no way this is going to pass. It's constitutionally insane. And then Roberts came out and he's like, aha, we're going to call it a tax. You go, what? Where'd that come from, John? But they did it. And so we're asking ourselves the same question, right? Is the judiciary going to step on the toes of the executive? Are they going to leave some discretion to them? Are they going to do something crafty and fancy and say like, well, Trump was, you know, his speech at the Capitol was outside of the presidency, but some of the other things were inside the presidency, right? You see how this can get spliced many ways. But what if Jack Smith, knowing that this case is going to be botched, not in the courts necessarily by the jurors, right? Trump will be absolutely convicted if the trial goes. And if it's given to a jury, right? No doubt. It's DC. But the law is on his side because they're the ones who shattered all the precedent and are trying to criminalize speech and then who are shattering due process and even discovery in this prosecution. So great questions. The surprising thing is that Jack Smith is asking this, right? These were questions that I thought Trump was going to bring up, but he is leading it because they are panicked. They need to get these answered immediately. And here is the petition. Bum, bum, bum. They say right here on petition before the judgment on appeal from the DC Court of Appeals. They say the special counsel, Jack Smith and his deranged thugs over there are hereby submitting this on behalf of our useless government and respectfully petitioning for a writ of certiorari for judgment before the lower court has even had a chance to opine on this is unusual saying of the United States Court of Appeals up to you. Now the opinion and order of the district court is not yet reported, but you can look it up if you want to. They say the judgment of Chutkin was entered and then the jurisdiction of this court is invoked as follows. They say now your honors at the Supreme Court, this is Jack Smith and his team writing saying, all right, Supremes, this case presents a fundamental question at the heart of our democracy, whether a former president is absolutely immune from federal prosecution for crimes committed while in office or is constitutionally protected from federal prosecution when he has been impeached but not convicted before the criminal proceedings begin. And we've talked about this, right? Trump was impeached in the House of Representatives but not convicted in the Senate. This is the second time absolutely for the January 6th case, right? That's the subject of the second impeachment, which mirrors this same charge. So if Trump was essentially acquitted, this is double jeopardy charging him again in the criminal court if the Constitution requires a conviction in the Senate before you can go down this road. Saying the district court, Jack Smith writes, the district court Chutkin rejected Trump's claims, correctly recognizing that former presidents named Trump are not above the law and they're accountable for their violations of federal criminal law while in office. Now, Trump, he appealed the ruling, rejecting claims of his immunity and the trial is scheduled to begin. Now, what's curious about this here, look at this. They say Trump's appeal of the ruling rejecting his immunity and his other related claims, however, suspends the trial of the charges against him. <gasps> oh, no. That sounds like Jack Smith is acknowledging that that trial is suspended. Uh-oh, man, they're going to be so mad over there. They are mad about that. They have been trying so hard to make this thing rigged so that it happens on the day before Super Tuesday. But Trump, just by virtue of appealing it, Jack says, mm, it's suspended. Uh. So then he says, it is of imperative public importance that respondents' claims of immunity be resolved by this court, the Supreme Court, and that Trump's trial proceed as promptly as possible if his claims 
claim of immunity is rejected. Now, I really hope that they explain why this is so necessary for us. Is it for the country? I mean, the country needs to know the outcome of this case before we can vote in November. Like, why can't you just wait until after the fact, Jack? Is it because of the election? Like, I know it's because of the election. I'm willing to admit that. Are you? Let's see. Respondents claims, Trump's claims, he says are profoundly mistaken as Judge Chutkin already held. Was anybody, you know, puts any faith in that one. But only this court, Supreme Court, can definitively resolve Trump's questions. And so this court should grant this case before judgment, before it's even really supposed to be here, so that it can provide the expeditious resolution that this case warrants, just as you've done before. They say, all right, Supreme Court, let me give you some background here. They say Trump served as president, as we know, January 2017 to 2021, pretty good years. The indictment alleges that Trump engaged in systematic and a deliberate effort to overturn the election results of 2020 and blah, blah, blah. Now on August 1st, we know, okay, August 1st, just think about how short this case is, by the way. Trial in March, what? For 13 million pages of documents and all the January 6th stuff? They're still releasing video footage. So a federal grand jury, they say in August, charged Trump with the various counts. Count one charges conspiracy to defraud the United States and alleges that he, seeking to reelect himself, conspired among others to overturn the legitimate results of the election, blah, blah, blah. Leverage DOJ state officials, we know the charges, and then attempted to obstruct the Capitol. Now, the district court scheduled trial to begin on March 4th, 2024, coming up the day before Super Tuesday, and they have already set out notices to jurors that we've covered here. But they are asking prospective jurors to also complete their questionnaires on February 9th, right? And that's like right around the corner. We're going to be there any minute. And all of this is in the lead up to March 4th. And so Donald Trump then, after all of this started, they're like, we're basically trial scheduled already. Like we already picked out the curtains for it. Says respondent, then Trump moved to dismiss the indictment on the grounds that he enjoys absolute immunity. Yeah, because he was executing the duties of America by not having our elections rigged. Saying that he is immune from criminal persecution and prosecution for anything that's taken in the outer perimeter of his official duties. He also argued, you can't prosecute me twice. Double jeopardy prohibits that. And the Senate already gave me my trial on this and I was acquitted. So you can't do it again. Now, Jack Smith and his deranged thugs there, they said that Trump has no absolute immunity from federal criminal prosecution. They said, even if such immunity existed, it would be narrower than the outer perimeter test. Okay. So like you can actually prosecute him for the things that he did saying that the presidential immunity is different from civil liability saying that even if that standard applied, this is Jack Smith, the indictment should not be dismissed because it's not in the outer perimeter. It's absolutely criminal. And it's also outside of the double jeopardy argument because they say that the constitution doesn't matter as usual. But the district court denied, this is Judge Chutkin, denied Trump's claims, both of them, the double jeopardy claim and the immunity claim, which are two separate and distinct entities. And the court concluded that the constitution's text and structure and history support the conclusion. And we read through this opinion from the judge. I think it was the one where she said there's no historical text that supports Trump's claim. And then we scrolled up literally to the page before that, where she cited Alexander Hamilton, who said exactly what we interpret it, it to be. So strange behavior, but anyways, it's her courtroom. So I guess she can do whatever she wants. The history support the conclusion. She says that Trump may be subject to investigation, indictment, prosecution, and conviction for any criminal acts undertaken while in office. Now, although the constitution's text does not address presidential immunity, which you would just infer then, why does everybody else get governmental immunity except the president, the court observed that silence did not reflect an understanding that Trump possessed immunity. In opposite, the court explained that the constitutional provision that Trump invoked the impeachment judgment clause cut against his immunity argument. She said that the constitution says that he should be prosecuted. She said that the first part of the clause limits the penalties of impeachment to removal and disqualification from office. And that the second part then says that quote, the party convicted may then later face criminal prosecution, but that any further punishment may not come from the legislature. She basically says it goes down two different tracks and you can basically follow both of them and only Congress can remove you and disqualify you, but only the other systems can criminally prosecute you. And so that's how we distinguish it, which is what we have said is that you have to go through, it's like an indictment process or it's like a safety valve. You have to be indicted in Congress. You have to be convicted in Congress in the political realm in the jurisdiction of the political world before you can be removed out of there and then prosecuted in the non-political world. And the reason for that is so that we have a separation between the two. So you don't 
have partisan prosecutor hacks like Tishy and Fannie and Jack Smith doing what they're doing. You got to go through Congress first, lest you can have these democracy people, you know, trying to undermine it, attack it. So Jack Smith continues. Now, the district court, Judge Chetkin, said that there were several features of the impeachment judgment clause that undercut Trump's claims. First, she changed the word or interpreted the word, nevertheless, she said that it doesn't bear on anything about whether they're subject to criminal prosecution. And she also said materials like those from Alexander Hamilton did not reflect the view that there was widespread consensus about the nature of that phrase, which, you know, Alexander Hamilton was a pretty important figure back at the time. Now, third, she said that Trump's interpretation of the impeachment judgment clause relied on a negative implication that a president who is not convicted in impeachment cannot face criminal prosecution. And that reflected neither logic nor common sense. Now, well, not for his presidential conduct. That's what we're talking about. Okay. You know, if the president goes and gets a DUI or something like that, right, it's a separate concept. Like he's being prosecuted for his presidential conduct. Now, finally, they say respondents interpretation would produce that there would be an anomaly that a former president would be immune if he committed a crime that was not covered. And so she came, you know, she read the rules and said, this could lead to an insane conclusion. And therefore we can't hold the rules work that way. Now, summarizing, they say that the district court also found nothing in the history to justify absolute immunity. And the court discerned no evidence that the founders understood the constitution to give that immunity. And here in some, they say Chutkin concluded exactly the way we want. And so we think that you should find similarly. So here is what they're asking for from the Supreme Court, telling us a cornerstone of our constitutional order that these people upended is this stupid phrase that they cannot get enough of. I think they probably have it written on their mirrors in the morning. Jack Smith says this every morning. No one's above the law, Jack. No one's above the law. They say no person is above the law, which is such a stupid phrase because the president literally is. I mean, I don't know how many times I can say it. I'm like a broken record here. Like literally somebody gets convicted of a crime through the regular order. They say you're guilty. You did something very bad. Jury of your peers convicts you. The president like this, watch this, pardoned, done, gone, doesn't count. Literally above that law. You're gone. Sorry. Doesn't matter. Right. And there's debate about whether the president can do it himself. So it literally is not that right. And if you want, don't want to use that example, you can also use the opinion clause example, which I think also says that he is above the law, the commander in chief, right? The laws say all these things. He just says, I'm doing this. I'm doing this, right? He is the root of the constitution. So it's a real stupid thing for them to say, but they keep saying it, but whatever. Now they say the four, like they're literally asking, excuse me, in this request, is Trump above the law? Like they're asking that in this very filing. And then they use this stupid sentence asking, does Trump have presidential immunity, making him above the law in our hack partisan prosecution? And then they say, no, no person's above the law. Okay. Now it's not really a cornerstone then if you have to ask about it, is it? So the force of that principle is at its zenith, whereas here a grand jury that nobody cares about out of Washington, DC has accused a former president of committing federal crimes. This is a hack grand jury out of DC. The reason why we don't allow that to happen is so that it goes through Congress, because if it's going to be politicized, we want to make sure Congress can vet it first. And they did. And guess what? He wasn't convicted, Jack. So they say to subvert the peaceful transfer of power to his lawfully elected successor, which we're debating that now. Yeah, a lot of people are saying that nothing could be more vital to our democracy than that a president who abuses the electoral system by what? Trying to make sure it's fair is to remain in office and held accountable for his criminal conduct. But Trump has asserted that the constitution accords him absolute immunity from prosecution and the constitution's text structure and history do not support that novel claim. Well, then why are you asking about it? The court has accorded, and why are you asking about it, Jack? Trump can make that claim, but you have some doubts, don't you? That's why you're asking. So the court has accorded civil immunity to the president in the case of Nixon versus Fitzgerald, but they held that the view that a sitting president cannot be indicted while in office. But those principles can't be extended to Trump. The separation of powers nor his acquittal in impeachment lifts him above the reach of federal criminal law. And like other citizens, he is accountable for criminal conduct. And again, right, like I said, like if Trump ran out and got a DUI today, yeah, like he doesn't have presidential immunity from that. Hello, that's not what we're talking about. He was doing conduct that was within the presidency, which was executing federal elections. And he had an opinion about it that he's entitled to. And I think he's been vindicated on. So, all right, this is 
is overbroad. Nobody's saying that he can go out and do, you know, criminal things and then just claim presidential immunity, like a get out of jail free card. It's ridiculous. So they say, all right, Jack Smith continues. The district court presiding over this case, this is Chutkin, all right? So every time they say that, you know, just insert Chutkin in there, okay? It makes it feel a lot less, you know, powerful. Judge Chutkin, okay. Now she rejected Trump's arguments, okay? Great, that's why he's appealing them to the Court of Appeals. And his notice of appeal, however, oh man, they are so mad about this. Trump's notice of appeal, however, suspends trial proceedings. Ah! <laughs> They're so bad about that. And they're referencing Trump's case, which is the case that we covered last time in their filing. Bummer. They're acknowledging that. Oh man. So that's why they're begging the Supreme Court. Can you please hurry, please? We need you to go because we need this trial. And they say Trump has moved for a stay of all proceedings in the district court while his appeal is pending, as is his right. Here's Jack Smith crying. It is of paramount public importance for us that Trump's claims of immunity be resolved as expeditiously as possible. And if Trump is not immune, that he receive a fair and speedy trial on these charges. Now, by the way, you know, speedy trial is in the interest of the defendant, okay, as much as it is for the government, right? So Jack Smith is on team government here, that we need to get this done so that the public knows that he's an insurrectionist and a convicted felon before the election, before they go vote on Super Tuesday, because they got to get him out of here. And then once he is convicted, as long as they can get it done before the election, they can take that to the RNC and boot him off of that, or they can retake their claims for ballot removal, boot him off of that, or they can just say he can't even vote for himself, like Chris Christie, like a broken record, and then to try to beat him in the court of public opinion, right? Options are many. But the right to a speedy trial doesn't mean that the prosecutors take meth and then prosecute you as quickly as possible, and the defense just, like, gets dragged along by it. No, the defense needs time to review the discovery. There are 13 million pages plus in this case, plus tens of thousands of hours of footage, I think is the number, and it is basically impossible for them to get it done from August to March to review all of the discovery. So Trump has a right to have this extended so that he can do his due diligence to actually review the evidence so that he can prepare his defense. And they're not really considering that at all, right? Because Chutkin doesn't care about that. And the case that we used for comparison was Walmart versus Visa, which had, I think, 8 million pages of documents and took seven years to litigate. So just do the compare and contrast. It's like seven months versus seven years. Trump has 13 million documents. Walmart versus Visa, 7 million pages or whatever the numbers were in that range. So they say the public and Trump and the government are entitled to nothing less. We have to go very fast. But if this case proceeds through the ordinary and even a highly expedited appellate process, Jack Smith says it is unclear whether this court would be able to hear and resolve this threshold immunity issue during its current term. That means we're going into 2025 and that insurrectionist might escape trial. So for that reason, Jack Smith says the government seeks a writ of certiorari before judgment to afford this court an opportunity to grant review now and ensure that it can timely resolve the important immunity question that is presented here. It says the United States recognizes, yeah, this is Jack hitting the panic button, oops, that this is an extraordinary request. Interesting. I remember some other extraordinary requests that the Supreme Court just threw out. Remember when Ted Cruz and a bunch of attorneys general had a very big emergency request in 2020? Can you please intervene and stop this election from being rigged? And the Supreme Court was like, uh, we're busy. Sorry. So what are they going to do here? Jack is in a real big hurry. Supreme Court could basically just say, eh, let's let the Court of Appeals deal with it. Move your trial date. This is an extraordinary case, which is a little bit of an about face, okay? Because remember when Trump was in there in Chutkin's courtroom, we had all the different transcripts from Jackson. He's like every other criminal defendant. He doesn't get any special privileges. Even Chutkin said, I don't care about the election. Chutkin said specifically, I don't give a whip about the election. So what is so extraordinary, Jack? Why is everything changing right now? What are you so freaked out about, man? This is just a regular defendant, just like anybody else. So they say this court should grant certiorari and set a briefing schedule that would permit this case to be argued and solved as promptly as possible. Man, he's nervous. Please, please, please. My homework is due. I need time. They say this case warrants immediate review. Why? This case involves a paradigmatic issue of imperative public importance. Let's see. The amenability to a criminal prosecution of a former president of the United States for conduct undertaking during his presidency. All right. I agree that is an important public issue, but why is it important 
important now? Like, why do we need that settled right now? Why can't we just resolve this, I don't know, a couple of years from now? Now, it requires no extended discussion to confirm that this case involving charges that Trump sought to thwart the peaceful transfer of power, they say, is at the apex of public importance. Maybe for these people. I think they, you know, have a hard time going to sleep at night. They wake up when cold Trump sweats. They say this implicates a central tenet of our democracy, which they don't care about. You know, it's really ridiculous. They shattered 234 years of democratic norms. Thanks, guys. And the charges allege that Trump conspired to transgress the law, intentionally using fraudulent means to obstruct an election. Now, the district courts at the trial, we know that. Precedent, they say, allows us to go fast. This case warrants a similar speed, like other cases. And the court should order expedited briefing. We're filing now because not only is this publicly significant, but we want to ensure that this case is argued this term. Why? Why, Jack? Tell us. As noted, trial is scheduled to begin on March 4th. Trump has appealed. Now, given the uncertain timing of the appellate proceedings in the ordinary course, including potential requests for rehearings, certiorari before judgment, like why we skipped over the Court of Appeals, is appropriate to allow the court to provide prompt review. And because this court has some discretionary matters, we're also concurrently filing documents in other courts, which we'll review in a later segment. They say, if this court grants review, if Supreme Court takes it, the government respectfully requests it establish a schedule for briefing that would allow this case to be resolved as promptly as possible so we can get this trial on track. But if the court opts not to grant review immediately, the government respectfully suggests that it consider postponing action on the petition pending further proceedings in the Court of Appeals so the court could grant certiorari immediately. Like, if you're going to make us go through the Court of Appeals, can you please make sure your printer is on? Because we're going to send our petition right back to you, like, as soon as we get it. And if the court elects not to review the case at this time, it may wish to note that the Court of Appeals should proceed with sufficient dispatch to permit the court to hear this case promptly during its term. Now, the petition is respectfully submitted by Jack Smith. Special counsel who's a little bit nervous over there. Oh, because he's got a rush, man. He's got just a short amount of time to get this thing going. And so they submitted an entire appendix and the rest of their filings here in the remainder of the document. But you can feel the nervousness there, right? We were waiting for this, but what we were expecting to see was Trump filing these appeals and landing at the Supreme Court, not Jack Smith. But he's nervous about it because the clock is ticking and they are in serious cope mode over there on MSNBC. They brought out Jack Smith's number one fan called Andrew Weissman, and he is explaining the news, saying, you know, this is a pretty smart move if he's going to try to maintain the March 4th trial date. See, that means this is already probably lost. That March 4th trial date probably getting moved. Here is Andrew Weissman explaining. Breaking news, special counsel Jack Smith's office has just informed the D.C. Circuit that they're going to ask the Supreme Court to immediately take up Donald Trump's claim that he is immune from criminal prosecution for the official acts taken as president. Trump's lawyers argue that his D.C. indictment should be dismissed. And joining us now is former senior member of the Mueller investigation, Andrew Weissman, and New York Times investigative reporter Suzanne Craig. So, Andrew, your reaction to Jack Smith's Thanks, taking Suzanne. that immunity claim immediately to the Supreme Court, I guess that was automatic. This is a very smart move on his part because there is a March 4th trial date. And one of the exceptions with respect to appealing things, normally you have to wait for your trial to be over before you can appeal. That is not the case with respect to claims by Donald Trump that he enjoys presidential immunity with respect to all of the charges. It is also not the case with respect to his claim that double jeopardy has attached and he can't be tried twice. The district court denied both of those in a very cogent opinion. Shutkin, it wasn't and cogent. that is now on appeal to the DC circuit. But there's an automatic stay that applies during that time. So that would jeopardize the March 4th trial date. So what Jack Smith has just done and minutes ago is asked the Supreme Court of the United States to go ahead and decide the case now. In other words, leapfrog over the DC circuit that is permitted under Supreme Court rules. And one of the cases that Jack Smith cites in support of the Supreme Court doing that is United States versus Nixon, where the Supreme Court, according to Jack Smith, did just that in order to expedite the hearing. We all wait and see what the Supreme Court does, but this is a smart move 
move on his part in order to try and maintain the March 4th trial date. Okay, it's a smart move because he's boxed in. He's got nowhere else to go. If he wants the March 4th trial date to go, then he has to get the Supreme Court to come in because Trump is just going to delay, man. He's going to drag his feet on it, as he should, as is his right. That's what they get for dumping 13 million pages of documents on him and saying, you have to review it in a matter of months. You can't do that. He has an absolute right to explore these things. Maybe they should have prosecuted him a long time ago, not in election year. Trump got some good lawyers and they have articulated this appellate process and they've timed it beautifully. And now it seems like the court of appeals and their process might cause the entire trial date to move. And so we'll be here continuing to cover. There will be some serious consequences on this. Hopefully we know what the Supreme Court says sooner rather than later, but we will be here continuing to cover this appeal and the others as we're going to cover. We've got more segments and different courtrooms to attend to, but we'll be covering all the Trump trials. So my friends, thank you for subscribing wherever it is you're watching this. Thank you for checking out robertgovea.com if you want to access any of the documents we went through, and we'll look forward to seeing you on the next one.